I can remember uh, my first hiking trip and wilderness experience. It really uh, stands out, and you're going to understand why my first, I say wilderness experience lightly, because uh, it was as wilderness as you can get in Ohio. Okay, so it's not as exciting as you probably could expect. But I can remember my first time. Uh, we, I was young. I wasn't even, I don't even think I had my driver's license yet. So I was, I was pretty young, and I had a group of, of friends. And so we decided, you know what? We want to try this backpacking thing. We want to try this hiking thing. And so we, we decided we're going to start hiking from the beginning of the Vermilion River. So the Vermilion River that goes up right around here in Vermilion, it's about 60 miles long. And so we said, you know what? We're going to go. We're going to go right to the start, right around the start, and we're going to hike all the way up to where it goes to Lake Erie. We can do it. And so we, we didn't understand anything, again, about backpacking or, or anything like that. So we, we saw, okay, it's, it's about 60 miles. All right, so I, we looked it up on Google, which don't ever trust Google. So we looked it up on Google, and uh, we figured, okay, you can, a person can, can walk about two to three miles per hour. So if we hike for eight to 10 miles, we can do 20 miles a day, easy. Okay, so we're gonna hike 20 miles a day. So we're gonna hike 60 miles in three days. Okay, we've never hiked before. All right, I'll just throw that out there. Okay, so we're gonna do it. So we got together all of our gear and uh, we got ready and we're gonna have a friend drop us off. Let me pause and say this. Hello, my name is Charlie and I am a glutton for punishment. <laughs> and by the way, I am the campus pastor at Avon Lake. To all you guys out at Avon Lake, what's up? I, I miss you all, but I hope you're having a great morning. So again, I, I love the outdoors, and uh, you're going to see in the story, but you're going to ask this question, I don't know why, after you hear what happens. So let's get back to the story. I just wanted to give a little introduction there. So we had a buddy that was going to drop us off. We had all of our gear, and we were going to get ready to go. And, and I want to show you a picture of the spirits that were high. That was, this is, this is an old picture. Again, it was like 15 or 16 years ago. So, so there we are. We're ready to go and take on the world. Now, here's a few things to, to realize. Our packs weighed anywhere from 50 to 60 pounds. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we, we had um, military surplus boots. Mine were about a size too big. We were wearing all cotton. We had military surplus backpacks, uh, old Boy Scout backpacks. We carried cans of beans and cans of corn. We had all the water we needed for the trip, we thought, in two liter bottles, like gallon, just gallons of water and two liters of water in our pack. We had trash bags with huge sleeping bags and pillows stuffed in there. We were all strapped in and we were ready to take on the world. So we got dropped off and we were ready to go. But here are a few things I, I, I just want to give you the full picture. It was pouring rain the entire time. There were no trails except for deer trails, and the weeds were this high, okay? So we had machetes, and we were bushwhacking our way <laughs> along the river. Okay, remember, we're going to make it 20 miles a day, all right? So we're bushwhacking our way along the river. We had to keep crossing the river back and forth. So every time you cross, the water is up to here. Your, our pants are soaked, okay? We're wearing these ponchos. In fact, one time, I'm a lot taller than my buddies, so I go to walk across the water, and they came, and the water was up to here on them, so their packs got soaked. We had a little, remember those little clickers, odometer things that you would wear on your belt that would click every time you walked back in the day before GPS? We had one of those to, to count our steps. That's how we were going to know how far we made it. We lost that in like the first two hours. So we had no idea how far we were going. We're just hiking along, and we are soaked and freezing to the core. We were hiking along. We ran out of water. We had to go to some guy's house and ask to use his water hose. We, we, we were so exhausted. I mean, remember, we're carrying 50-some pounds. And, and uh, we also found out that we heard through the grapevine that there was a huge storm coming. Again, the story doesn't keep getting better. There's a huge storm coming. So we ended up camping under a highway bridge like we were homeless, okay? So we're, we're camping under this highway bridge to stay out of the storm. We had no fire. Our, our sleeping bags, our tents were soaked, so we were freezing all night long. It was miserable. The next day we woke up, we started hiking, and I was limping. My leg was hurting, so I'm limping along the whole time. I'm literally limping like this. My friend falls in the river. He's soaked to the bone now, completely soaked. We are at an all-time low. In fact, I have a kind of picture. This is, you know, how it started, and then here's how it was going. <laughs> a little picture of how things were. But again, it was a very 
terrible experience. And it was, it was again, this awful, awful time. Needless to say, we didn't even make it to the end of our goal. On day two, about half, partway through day two, we realized there's no way. So we called my buddy. And the last memory I have is we were laying out in the pouring rain at night, laying out on the grass by a stop sign like this, waiting. We're just giving up, like waiting for, for the guy to come pick us up because we were, we were done. But the crazy thing is we got home and we started planning our next trip for some reason. Again, a glutton for punishment. But that's how the outdoors, that's how the outdoors works. That was a pretty low time. And it was one of those experiences in my life that I, what I say, what I call sharpens the life knife. Sharpens our life and makes us stronger and better. It's, it's those, those rough wilderness times in our life. But here's the thing about that, that story and what I've realized from back, backpacking in the backcountry. You learn a lot when you go through a hard time, when you're in a hard season. And that's true on the side of a mountain. It's also true in our personal spiritual lives. Emotionally, we, uh, we experience hardship. We go through trials and hardship and times, and, and we're beaten down. And it's in those, those desolate places, those wilderness times, that we experience temptation and struggle. Jesus was brought into the wilderness, and he experienced a time of brokenness. He experienced a time of, of trials and temptation, and it was in those weary places. It's in those weary places that we experience that pain and that suffering. But I, but I want us to unpack a little bit of that today. I want us to think about what can we learn in the midst of those wilderness times in our life? Because it's in those times when, when we're weary that, that Satan knows, he's, he's no dummy. The devil knows how to come in when we're, when we're at our weariest. He knows how to come in to tempt us. And, and we're in, again, and we're in this series, Fight for Your Life. And so we're talking about fighting, fighting the, the fight that we're in, the fight against temptation. So we're going to look at a passage of scripture. We're going to dig into this text here today. We're going to look and, and, and unravel some of these truths of this wilderness in our lives. So what should our mindset be? How should we handle temptation? How should we go about this, this time and this season in our lives where we might find ourselves struggling? We have maybe a hardship, a hard time. We, we've had a rough week. We've experienced death. We've experienced loss. Maybe we're just, we just hate ourselves. You ever look in the mirror and just, man, I just, I just don't like that guy. Am I the only one that's experienced a wilderness time, a, a time of, of pain and sorrow and desolation in our hearts? If you live any amount of time, you're going to experience that. So I think we can glean some truths today as we look in Luke. So we're going to be in Luke 4. So you can turn there in your Bibles. We're going to be in Luke 4. And as we, we look at this, I think we can, we can glean some truths from God's word. We can glean some truths from, from how he handled temptation, how he dealt with with the trials. So we're going to look today. We're going to be in Luke. So if you turn with me, once you get there, Luke 4, we're going to be starting in verse 2, picking up where we left off. You guys can stand to your feet. We're going to be in Luke 2, or 4, I'm sorry, starting with verse 2. But we're going to be starting with 2b. Okay, so the second part of 2. So I'm going to go ahead and I am going to read that for us. It says this, he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. You may have a seat. Sorry to do a little bit of up-down there for you, but uh, we're going to continue to unpack this. We're going to continue to look at this temptation together. So here's what we see. Okay, so we see that Jesus is hungry because he's been in the wilderness for 40 days eating nothing. God led him into the wilderness to experience a time of, of trial and testing. And so he is very depleted. He's very weary. He's very tired. And again, like I said, Satan is no dummy. He's kind of he's like a, a lion that, that watches for that that wildebeest that's weak. Have you ever seen a pride of lions attack? They go for the weak, wilde they go for the smallest one. They go for the wildebeest, that's, that, that animal that's, that's at its lowest point. That's how Satan works. That's how the devil works. That's how he works in, in, in his economy. He waits for the most opportune time when he can come in and he has the upper hand. 
So he shows up. He shows up when Jesus is depleted, when he's hungry. And again, Luke mentions this. He says he was hungry. And I'm like, okay, yeah, no dippity. 40 days without food? Like, we understand that. Why does he mention it? We're going to see that as we unpack this idea of hunger and the importance of understanding hunger and what it plays in Jesus' trial and his temptation. So Satan shows up. So he comes and he says, if you are the son of God. Let's pause here for a minute. One word changes a lot. If you remember earlier in the story of Christ's baptism, when he's baptized, the father speaks and says, you are my son. He says, you are my son. I love you. I'm so proud of you. Such a powerful statement. You are my son. Notice the difference. He literally adds one word. He says, if you are the son. If. He literally, that's all. He, he just changes one little word, and it, and it creates a whole different feel for this, for this phrase, for this question. If. It becomes like a prove it temptation. Like, hey, if you really are, if you are, then you need to prove it. You need to do this to prove it. Like, if you really are that good, you know, it's those, that's like the, the playground bullies. If you really are that good, you know what, if you're the best basketball player, oh, yeah, well, you better, you go ahead and make that three-pointer. Yeah, you better prove it. And all of a sudden, it makes the, the accuser the arbiter of truth. Satan steps in and says, if you are the son of God, here's a test, if you are. Here's the crazy thing, though, and that's a little side note. Jesus doesn't fall for it, and, and, and the fact that he doesn't fall for it actually does prove that he's the son of God, which is pretty cool if you think about it. So Satan says, if you are the son of God, he says, tell this stone to become bread. And at first glance, it sounds like it's all about hunger. It sounds like it's all about a physical need, to to meet a physical need to eat food. And and I want to tell you this, that's just a small portion of the story. Because eating is important, and God gave us food and bodies that we need to nourish. And so I don't want you to get caught up in that detail. It has so much less to do with that. What it really has to do is the fact that he was tempting Jesus to short circuit what God has. He was telling, listen, Jesus, you are, we know who you are, okay? I get this, this whole suffering thing, this is cute. But you could end this right now. You could, you could take this into your own hands. You, we know that you could literally turn stone into bread. Come on, Jesus, like, quit messing around. This whole human thing, the suffering thing, this is cute. We, you and I know, we, Satan says, you and I know, we know who you are. We know that you can turn this stone into bread. Just, just do it. Come on. Take the easy way out. Take the easy way out. The temptation, his first temptation is, has everything to do with short-circuiting God's best. The desire to elevate comfort above God's plan. So here's what the temptation is. It's the temptation to say, listen, God, I, I get that you're leading. I get that you're all great and everything, but, but really what you offer isn't good enough. In fact, I value my comfort. I value what I want way more, way more than what you want. So I'm going to choose to take the easy way out. I'm going to choose to turn this stone into bread because I am tired of suffering. It's God's best that's on the line. And so the temptation is, listen, Jesus, come on. Who are you kidding? We know. We all know that you could end this right now. Do it. Do it. Like, seriously. Satan's like, go ahead, man. Like, uh, no one else is here. It's just me, you and me. No one else is witnessing this. It's just you and me. And at the end of the day, like, you you can take this in your own hands. But the beauty of the story is in the fact that Jesus didn't do that. Jesus chose a different way. And as we continue to look, let's continue to look. Let's look at the story. Let's let's see what happens next. And and I love what he says in Luke 4.4. It says, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. These are words that are quoted from Deuteronomy. He's quoting an Old Testament passage. He's quoting this this powerful phrase from Deuteronomy. It is written, he says. You notice Jesus didn't take the temptation that I would have taken to just like, you know what? All right, Satan. Like, oh man, you got it coming to you. Like, all right, you you want to see if I'm really the son of God? I'm going to take it to you. Like, I got the power. I created the universe, and and you think that you can come at me with this kind of a a threat? What does Jesus do instead? He He quotes scripture. 
He literally goes to the word of God. This is a pretty cool thing because the reality is he was a student of the word. If, if you, when we read earlier in Luke, he actually was in the temple learning from God's word when he was among the religious leaders. But not only that, he was the word. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. How cool is that? So here he is. He's quoting the word of God. That's how he goes to battle. He understands, like Ephesians tells us, that, that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. So Jesus quotes God's word. And what we learn is that God's word is how we do battle. If we're going to go to war against Satan, it, 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 it's got to start with the idea that God's word is how we go to battle. You're going to see this traced all throughout the temptation story, the narrative we're going to read in the next few weeks, is that it always comes back to God's word. Christ constantly quotes God's word. And so for us, the, the first, the foundational spot, that if we're going to truly fight against temptation, we have to quote, we have to read, we have to be able to internalize God's word because the truth is this, what we put in impacts how we live out. What we put into our hearts, what we feed on spiritually impacts how we live it out, how we face trials, how we face temptation. So first and foremost, we get this. Jesus goes right to God's word. That's what we have to do. We have to go to the word of God. We have to trust that this is God's word and I'm gonna go here in the midst of my trials. God has given us, it's literally the manual for life. If you want a manual for how to handle temptation, go to God's word. He's given us everything we need. And so Jesus, he goes to the word of God in the midst of his trials. Again, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Why does he quote that? This is an interesting connection, and I think it's so important for us to understand. Jesus quotes a passage from Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy 8.3. And I would encourage you to turn there because this is going to be a really cool connection point. So, so turn that to Deuteronomy 8.3. It's in the beginning of the Bible. Um, it's in the first four books. You just got to find it. You'll find it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All right, right there. You'll, you'll find it. So why does he quote Deuteronomy? There's a pretty cool connection here. See, there was another group of people called the Israelites. And they experienced a time of trial and testing in the wilderness. And their, their trial and testing had a different outcome. And it's important for us to see the connection. I just want to draw, there, there's a few connections here that I want to draw you, uh, your attention to when it comes to Jesus and Israel. First of all, we see 40 years, 40 days. Remember, the Israelites were tried and tested and experienced wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Now here's Jesus coming back to the wilderness to experience trial and testing for 40 days. Pretty cool connection there. They both experienced testing. Israel was tested, continually, continued to be tested over and over. Now Jesus is experiencing testing. There were 12 tribes of Israel and 12 disciples of Jesus. Another cool connection, Israel was tested and failed, but the best part is Jesus was tested and succeeded. That's important for us to understand because if we really believe that we are in Christ, that means that when Christ succeeded, we succeed. That means that the victory has already been won in Jesus Christ because Israel failed. Israel failed miserably, but Jesus sent a savior so that the victory is won in Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand that as we're facing temptation, it's already been won for us. We just have to, to rest in the fact that Jesus wants to fight our battles with us and for us. That is such an important truth because Jesus succeeded. Jesus succeeded. Now, let's turn, let's look. And again, I said we're gonna be looking in Deuteronomy. This is such a powerful passage Deuteronomy, we're going to start with Deuteronomy 8.2. This is talk, he's talking to Israel. He says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. They were tested. They experienced 
trial. And what would happen over and over is that they would drift from God. They, they would literally would drift away and God would come and pull them back. And they would drift away and God would continue to pull them back over and over throughout the wilderness that we see this. Really all throughout Israel's history was them drifting and God would pull them back. And there was this time of testing and trial and they made so many mistakes. Where we're seeing that in, in, our, in our church-wide devotions, we're reading about some of the craziness that's gonna happen and has been happening all throughout the Old Testament of Israel drifting and God pulling them back and Israel drifting, God pulling them back. You think God wasn't full of grace in the, in the Old Testament? He was because he stayed the course with Israel and continued to bring them back. So they were in the wilderness and they were tried for these years. And then he continues, this is the, the connection in, in, in verse three, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This is a very important thing to understand, that God gave them manna because he wanted them to rely on him. They had nothing to eat. God said, you know what? I got you. He gave them manna. He wanted to show them that God is good even in the wilderness. Even in the midst of, of wandering for 40 years, God was still good. He was still leading them. He was still with them. And so when he talks about, listen, man does not live from bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is saying, listen, it, you find it in my word. You find it through prayer. You find it through my speaking to you. I am here. I am guiding you. I am an intimate God that is in the midst of your wilderness. Israel, I'm here with you. I am guiding you. I'm giving you manna so that you literally, you're gonna starve or you're gonna rely on me. You're gonna starve or you're gonna trust that my best is what's best. You're gonna trust what I have for you. And so this connection is powerful. The Lord your God, he says, God led you all the way in the wilderness. This is Deuteronomy 8.2. God led you. And this is a powerful connection to Jesus. In Luke 4.1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. How cool is that? The God who had led Israel in the wilderness is now leading Jesus in the wilderness. We can't miss out on these connections. God's word is so cool, isn't it? Because you can un uncover so many cool layers of how things were written and what God wants to teach us here today, that in the midst of this, God is faithful and he is leading. Jesus was fully satisfied in God. He trusted him in the midst of the trials that we read here in this text. And he was led by the Spirit. I love the, the connection and, and the unity found in, um, in, in the Trinity. They had perfect communion, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, they enjoyed unity together. They enjoyed a relationship together since forever. Like for, they've always existed together, the three in one. And so Jesus, we now see that he's being led by the Father. He's being led by the Holy Spirit. And he's there experiencing these trials. He's quoting God's word. We see pieces and parts of the whole Trinity on full display through the temptation. Jesus is being led by the Spirit. And it is a powerful time. So for us, here's what I want us to uncover and, and think about in our lives. We have to trust God in the midst of our wilderness experience. If you've been around, if you've lived any amount of time, you know that there is a lot that happens in life. And life, it frankly, sucks sometimes. There's so much that is thrown at us and we experience things. Maybe you're in the midst of a wilderness or, de or desolate place. Maybe you're, you're experiencing that desolation, that, that, that dry season, that hard trial. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe you've just come out of it. Maybe this is the first week you've had a breath of fresh air. You feel like you've come out of that wilderness experience and finally you can breathe again. Or maybe things are going well. But that wilderness experience is coming next week or next month or next year when you least expect it because don't get too comfortable. Life throws a lot at us. We have a lot of baggage. We have a lot of hardship. We have a lot of trials. We have a lot of pains that we go through. 
The dry wilderness seasons can look like a lot of things. Here's a list. Death, depression, tiredness, hunger, lost children, relational loss, physical pain, emotional pain, loneliness, financial loss, spiritual warfare, broken relationships, broken trust, broken spirits, broken bones, family drama, addictions, bullying, social issues, politics, tribalism, church splits, weight gain, anxiety, social media, and taxes. Did I get them all? Life is hard. And there are a lot of times, there are a lot of years where you might find more, you're suffering in those wilderness times more than you're not. You're gonna find that you're gonna be struggling with life and life's gonna throw a lot at you. And temptation comes, there's there's an acronym, temptation comes, it's when we're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or bored. Those Those are the triggers often that come. And so in the midst of all the struggles and hardships that we're facing, it's when we are depleted that Satan says, knocks on our door and says, hey, I'm here. I, I, I'm going to tempt you. And here's the interesting thing about the temptation to, to go around God's best, to get out of those trials and those suffering seasons. It's really the American temptation. Think about it. We, we love comfort. We elevate that, the fact that we can throw money at anything. We have great retirement funds and Roth IRAs. We have robust health insurance plans. And, and so any hardship and trial, we can just kind of take the exit the quick way out. We love to look for the quick way out because heaven forbid we suffer. Heaven forbid we lose our comfort. Heaven forbid we have to persevere through something hard. I don't know about you, but I fall into that trap. I feel like I have my phone glued to me all the time, so I'm never bored, right? I'm always scrolling social media. I'm always buying something to feel, get, a, get a, a dopamine hit. I'm always looking for the next adventure because we live in America where we have everything at our fingertips. So in a lot of ways, this temptation is our temptation. But we're going through a lot, right? Like, oh, I get it. Like the, the temptation, they'll understand. Like I, 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 I'm, they'll understand. It's just this, they'll understand. They will understand mentality. Like, oh, you know what? I, I'm really struggling. They'll understand if I, you know, it, they, it's been a hard week. And, and, and it, just if I, if I look at that, that pornographic thing or go on, look at porn online, no, it's been hard. They'll understand. They'll, they'll let it slide. They'll get it. Uh, I really, I really struggled. Like it's been, it's, I'm so tired. They'll understand if I lash out at my family or if I snap at my kids. They'll understand. We we begin to create these narratives of they'll understand. I don't know who they are, right? I don't know. Who, we create this jury. Like oh, they'll get it. Like they'll understand it. I don't know how how about you, but in, in the midst of those temptation times when I'm I'm just struggling, I'm really struggling. It's that it's that voice in the heck, back of my head that says they'll understand. Go ahead. Like it's okay. Like. They'll get it. Go, go ahead, just, just dabble in that sin. Go ahead. Go ahead. They'll understand. Take the easy way out. Take, go ahead. And so either we give in to sin because we say, you know what? They'll understand. I, I can do it. I don't know who they are because the reality is they won't understand. We're not called to do this. Jesus calls us to endure through the temptation, through those trials. He doesn't call us to take the easy way out, to look to get out easy, to look to end the suffering either by circumventing it or short-circuiting God's plan or to give in. That's not God's best for us. And I want to look at this verse. This is a a verse that Jim talked about last week. And we're going to look again, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can Endure it. I want to focus on one phrase at the end. So that you can endure it. So many people memorize this verse. It's so interesting. So many people memorize this verse and they forget the last part. They forget what is arguably the most important part of this passage. So that you can endure it. So that you can go through it. To endure literally means to stand up under or to bear up under. It's, it's literally saying, you know what? I'm going to bear up under and be willing to endure through the trial, through the temptation. I'm not going to look for an easy way out. I'm going to endure it. It may never go away. I'm going to endure 
it. It kind of reminds me, uh, I have an illustration here. It kind of reminds me of uh, something called the Murph or the Murph challenge. And what this is, is, is it is a challenge where uh, you, it's, it's every Memorial Day. So it's coming up at the end of May, and I, and I do it every Memorial Day. And here's what the Murph Challenge is, okay? It's for, it's for a fallen soldier who, who was killed. He was a Navy SEAL. And so it is to honor all the fallen veterans. So every year, all of these people, all these crazy people who are glutton for punishment, I guess that's a theme in my life, they come to work out, to do this workout. And here's what the challenge is. You run one mile, then you do 100 push-ups, Two or 100 pull-ups, I'm sorry, 200 push-ups, 300 air squats, and then you run another mile, okay? And it's for time. And you do it all with a 20-pound weight vest, okay? So you put the 20-pound, I'm going to put this on. So you have this weight vest, and uh, so, you, so you wear it, and, and I'm telling you, this is a hard hard um, challenge, the Murph challenge. And so you start by running, and, and as you're running, you're wearing the weight vest, okay? You're, you're carrying this weight. And as you do all of your sets, you don't take off the vest in between when you're doing your pull-ups and when you're doing your, your, your push-ups and your, and, and your squats. You, you don't take off the vest as you're doing the workout. You continue to wear it the entire time. You literally bear up under it as you go. It's this idea that when I start this workout, when I start this challenge, I will carry this weight the entire time. I understand that I have to bear this. I have to endure this through the entire challenge. The same is true when we think about temptation. God sets the pace as we go through those times of desolation and trials. When we go through those times of tempting, God sets the pace. And we have to be willing to say, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And I will bear under the weight of this burden. I will endure through the trial no matter how long it takes because you are faithful and I trust you. The temptation to take it off and say, okay, get rid of this. Either I'm going to give in and, and get rid of it, get rid of it. I'm just going to give in. All right, Satan, you win. I'm going to give in. Or I'm going to look for a quick way out. I got to get out of this, this suffering. God, get me out of this suffering. I can't handle it. God's just saying, listen, pump the brake. Pump the brake for a minute. Slow down. Look for the lessons to be learned here. Embrace the fact that we have trials in our lives. Embrace those wilderness experiences because there are lessons to be learned. When you have eyes to see what God wants to teach you, when you're going through those trials, it changes everything because you start seeing ways that you're getting stronger, right? When, I, when I'm working out, when I'm wearing this vest, when I, when I train for the Murph to do that challenge, I am getting stronger. My time gets shorter to complete the challenge. I'm getting better at my, my pull-ups and my push-ups and my squats because I'm carrying this burden. I'm carrying this weight. God is saying, don't lose sight of what I want to teach you in the wilderness. Just like God led Jesus while he was in the wilderness, God is leading you wherever you are. He's right there with you. He's saying, listen, let's go through this together. I get that it's heavy. I get that it's hard, but I have so much more in store for you. There's a paradigm shift we need. Instead of thinking about how to get out of temptation, we need to think about how to endure through it. Instead of trying to find the easy way, I can get me out of this, I can't handle this, we need to think about how to endure through it. We have to change our, the paradigm in our mind. We have to reshape how we handle temptation. So Jesus, again, is here. He's tempted. Satan comes and says, listen, we know who you are. You can take the easy way out. Go ahead. And, and Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to choose to trust God. I'm going to choose to trust God, even if it means I have to carry this weight. Even if it means that I have to go through 40 days of suffering and experience an onslaught of temptation that's humiliating. Even if I have to go through this, Jesus, I trust you and I'm willing to carry this for you. So what does it mean for temptation for us? What is the mindset change? Here is what we need to do when we think about temptation. It should change our entire mindset. God is calling us to trust his lead and embrace the place 
Trust that God has a plan for your life. Trust that those, those seasons of hardship, those seasons of trial might be part of that plan. That God maybe wants to strengthen you. He has something better for you in store. If you'll just push through, if you will just endure and then embrace that wilderness place. Embrace it. For me, you know, we go, th- I don't know if you've never, I don't, I've never gone through a week where I've never been tempted, just to be honest. Temptation happens all the time. And it's been pretty cool for me as I've, I'm reading God's word, I've been challenged by God's word that, that as I read this, it makes me, it just changes how I view everything. About anytime I have a temptation to, to do something or say something or, or look at something or, or act out in some way, when I feel that temptation come on, I go, okay, let me pause for a minute. Let me pause and ask the question, God, what do you want to teach me as I come through this? as I endure, as I come out of this temptation, as I'm in this wilderness place, what's the plan you have for my life? God, what do you you want to do as I'm carrying this weight, as as I'm feeling this trial? It changes how we view trials and temptations. And in fact, it almost makes us, it invites us. It's like we invite them. We're like, oh man, all right, God, I'm, I'm excited. I have eyes to see. I can't wait to see how you are going to show up. And, and our eyes are open and we get, oh man, okay. All right, God, I, I'm trusting you're going to move. I'm excited to see what's going to happen on the other side. How oh, I'm going to be stronger through Jesus because of you. All right, bring it on, God. It changes everything. We become like, we become like bodybuilders or CrossFit athletes that are ready to take on the next challenge because every time we go through a challenge, we come out the other side stronger and we go, all right, God, I love this. I'm in. I'm in, God. I'm excited. And temptation now looks completely different. Satan used to have the upper hand, right? But now all of a sudden, God does, because now it's a test. Now it's a chance for us to come out stronger. Now it's a chance for us to come out and trust God's plan and embrace the place in our lives. It's it's just such an important thing for us to grasp. I want to look at this verse as we wrap up here. This is such a powerful verse in James 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great, what does that word say? Joy, right? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is faith is fully developed, you will be perfect, complete, needing nothing. Look at these words. When your faith is tested, there's that word again, your endurance, your ability to get through it, your ability to endure has a chance to grow. And then what is that next phrase? Let it grow. Let it grow. Don't short circuit God's plan for your life. Let it grow. We get endurance like an endurance athlete by going through it, not bailing out from it. We go through it. We wear the weight and experience the other side, that that strength that comes from Christ on the other side when he pulls us through it and says, listen, I have so much more for you, church. Our Our society is full of weak people who bail on everything and and value comfort as the idol above everything else. He's saying, church, I have more for you. I want you to be those who endure. I want to see a people who come and endure. But it comes only through Jesus Christ. It comes only through trusting him by going to his word. It comes only when we realize that strength comes through the Holy Spirit in us, that God is working with us and through us, and that God made the way possible, that he endured it, and that though we may fail, God never fails. So let's just realize that we're on God's team. Let's say, God, all right, come on. I I got this temptation. God is a test. I want to go through this with you. He's like, all right, let's do it. Let's endure together. Because our flesh may fail, but our God, he never will. Our flesh may fail. We mess up. We give in. There's grace for that. Praise the Lord, right? We're not missing out on eternal life. We're missing out on the abundant life. That's one thing that Jim said. It's important to understand. When we give in a temptation, we're not, we're not losing our salvation. We're just missing out on the abundant life that God has for us. But God is saying, let's endure. Let's go through. Let's endure this together. Let's trust and embrace what God has for us. This is the last parting thought that that I thought was pretty interesting and powerful to think about. Picture if Jesus really did give in to temptation. Like what, what if Jesus was like, okay, Satan, I will turn this 
this stone into bread and get myself out of the suffering. And picture Jesus later when he gives the Sermon on the Mount and he says, hey, don't worry about where your food comes from. Don't worry about your clothes. God's gonna take care of you. And his disciples would look at him and go, it's easy for you to say. You can just look at a stone and make it into a Subway sandwich, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. You, 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 it, it, easy for you to say. You, you're the God. Like, look, you literally can turn, you've been turning stone into bread to feed yourself all the time. Like, come on, you're telling us we gotta go through trials and we, we have to not worry about where our food comes from. That's not what Jesus did, did he? Jesus chose the trial. Jesus trusted the Lord and embraced the place he had for him. He was willing to endure so that now we have a high priest, we have Jesus, that we now can resonate with, who understands our weakness because he went through it and came out on the other side. And now we can say, Jesus, you did it. Now you're gonna help me do it. Let's do it together. Thank you, Jesus, for your your victory. Thank you, Jesus, for your obedience. It's a powerful, powerful truth. The world struggles to suffer well. And here is my last thought I wanna leave you with. What if your testimony was he or she suffered well? You wanna stand out as a light in the world? Learn how to suffer well. Learn how to get through those those desolate, dry seasons of wilderness where there's temptation and you're handling, you're dealing with so much onslaught. Learn how to go through that well because you will be so different than what the world offers. You'll be so different than the world because the world always short circuits what God has. God is calling us to trust, to understand that when we endure through the trial, there's so much more life on the other side. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those wilderness seasons of temptation and suffering and trial. God, I mean it when I say thank you. God, I'm I'm thankful that you give us those times when we can be strengthened, when we can learn to endure. Lord, may we be a people who don't look for the easy way out, who don't go turning stone into bread to get out of the situation, throwing money at things or taking the sinful route of just get rid of it, I'm gonna give in. God, may we be people who endure. May we be people who trust you, to trust your plan and embrace the place you have us knowing that you're there with us the whole time. Lord, we wanna be people that no matter the weight you've given to us, you, we were trusting, Lord, that you wanna sharpen us and strengthen us and teach us endurance so that we can be people who endure no matter what and our testimony can stand out from the world because he and she and we as a church, we are people who suffer well and endure no matter the hardship. God, change us in that way. Jesus, we pray this in your mighty name. Amen.